brief introduction. Yeah, so our speaker today is Dominic Coz from uh, the University of Stuttgart. Uh, his research background is in simulation technology and is currently a focus on solutions to inverse problems in possibility theory and a numerical implementation. Um, so he's here today to discuss, introduce uh, possibility theory, the active fuzzy set theory, a framework it provides for approaching imprecise probabilities and their applications. So Dominic, I'd like to take it away. Okay, um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, as you can see, the title of the talk is uh, a rather bold statement and perhaps something like this, this lower title here would be more um, sensible. So a fuzzy approach to uncertainty quantification with imprecise probabilities. Um, nevertheless, it is my, my intention to convince all of you that in fact, possibility theory and possibility calculus is embarrassingly simple. Um, since you were, talk, um, you were promised to talk about fuzzy analysis, I'll, I'll start with a little story that I think some of you may be able to relate to. So imagine you've just graduated from university and you want to pursue a PhD in uncertainty quantification and you've been educated in probability theory and statistics and you're comfortable with these topics. And now you progress with your research and the integrals get nastier and nastier and naturally you're wondering whether there is an easier way to go about this. And then one day the following conversation happens between you and a senior researcher. And he's asking you, so you know sets, right? And you're, yep, sure, I've heard of them. And then they ask you, so have you ever thought that their edge may not be as crisply defined as you want them to be for something, for, some, for example, like the set of tall people in Europe? Yep, sure. So we have something like, I don't know, a boundary which is, which is not as, as crisp as we want them to be. And then they ask you, so have you ever considered a theory of these fuzzy boundaries? And you're like, no, that sounds way too complicated. I wouldn't want to think of something like that. And then he's like, okay, well, Latvi's added did, and it's not, not in fact so, it's so difficult. You just replace the traditional indicator function, which is zero, one valued, and gives you a precise membership or non-membership with a membership function, which is somewhere, somewhere gradual, between zero and one. And you're like, okay, and what, what do you do with that? And then he's, he goes on to tell you that, well, we have this thing, the extension principle, and let's you compute basically everything. So this is the formula. It looks much more complicated than it actually is. And you're still not convinced, like, okay, what, what do you do with it? And he's telling you, okay, you can use it for uncertainty quantification. It's just like probability theory, but without the difficult integrals. And then you think to yourself, okay, finally, I've found the answer. I'm never going back to probability theory. And basically you start computing with your extension principle. And then a couple of days later, you come back and ask him, okay, one last thing, how do I get this membership function? And he then goes on and uh, tells you, oh, this is easy. All you need is this, it's our holy grail, the triangular fuzzy number, and then you're already um, set to go. And this is fuzzy set theory in a nutshell. And so this is may or may not be the story of how I was introduced to fuzzy set theory. But um, soon afterwards, I had I found some issues that I had with it. So we have in this in the fuzzy literature many heuristic approaches, which are in in some other fields maybe well warranted. But for uncertainty quantification, I'm not so sure because I think we should be able to derive a rig rigorous theory from the bottom. Um, we have very different interpretations of fuzzy sets and memberships. Sometimes it seems like you're not actually talking about the same thing, even though you're using the same words. And I'm, th I'm thinking, should there not be unique and intuitive interpretation? Um, you have sometimes ill-motivated triangular fuzzy numbers and so-called expert knowledge, to which I, I'm thinking is objectively modeling the uncertainty, not the important part of the uncertainty quantification. You should first be able to describe your uncertainty in a, in a sensible way, and then start with the other stuff. And lastly, the unspeakable things that people do to their data. So I'm, I'm not so sure of this concept called fuzzification of data. And so those are some issues. And I think what the intention of this talk is to show you how possibility theory is able to address these issues. And this is also basically the outline of my talk. So I promised you a, or more or less promised you a rigorous theory from the bottom up. So we'll start with the axioms of possibility theory then I'll explain to you how possibility theory can be used as a framework for imprecise probabilities. 
Um, I'll, I'll, the most important part of this talk is going to be modeling the uncertainty with possibilistic variables. And I'll, I'll spend some time on the possibilistic calculus, which I, as I told you is embarrassingly simple. And lastly, I'll, I'll give some, some comments on how you can compute with possibilities and the different ways in which you can do that. So let's start with the axioms. Basically, a possibility measure is very similar to a probability measure, even though it's not quite the same. So we start with a measurable space. And then we introduce a possibility measure, which is a set valued function, just like a probability measure. The only difference is that for unions of sets, what you're doing instead of the sum of those, the individual possibilities, you're taking the supremum. And this is basically the story of possibility theory. If you're replacing your sums and integrals by a suprema, then this is more or less 90% of what you, what, you, uh, what you wanna do for possibility theory. And those of you who are familiar with belief functions and non-additive measures may know that you, you can usually define a dual measure, which uh, we call the necessity measure, which just is, is just the one minus the possibility of the complement. And the axioms for this or the properties of this measure are the same, or basically they're equivalent to a possibility measure. And there's no new information in that, it's just a different way of presenting it, but it's, it's useful to have both these measures. And now since, well, I'm an engineer, so I want to compute with the numbers. And what we need for this is, is an uncertain variable. Whenever I'm talking here about uncertain variables or random variables or fuzzy variables, uh, it's the same concept. You just have a map from the sample space to the real numbers. And then naturally we get a possibility distribution just like in probability theory, um, which is basically gives you the possibility that your random or fuzzy variable um, takes some, assumes some value. Um, or not. And this is basically the standard approach that Didier Dubois and Henri Prad um, well, advocated. And this, their, their view of possibility theory is mainly what I'm, I'm following here. So if we're talking about uh, possibility distributions, the easiest way to talk about them is via their densities. So I'm calling them possibility densities. They, they are basically the fuzzy membership function. There's been a lot, a lot been said about their, the duality of those two, two concepts, but for now, just trust me on this. It's, it's something like the fuzzy membership function. And I'm calling it a possibility density because it's very similar to probability density, even though, well, you, know, you, you heard me before, um, just replace the integral by the supremum. So the properties are the same as a probability density just here the supremum has to be one instead of the integral. And then it could look something like this. So this is the triangular fuzzy number. And what we have is, well, the possibility distribution is just the supremum over, over the in individual, uh, the possibilities of, of the individual elements of some, some set, for example. So this is all very analog to probability theory. And the nice thing about these possibility densities is that we basically have two points of view. So the first one would be something like the element-wise plausibility. So this gives us the membership value, gives us the plausibility that X would assume this value. And the other point of view would be a level-wise view. So we're taking the level at uh, the super level sets, the strict super level sets of, of our possibility density. And this gives us the alpha cuts, what we call in, in fuzzy set theory, the alpha cuts. And those two concepts are, are important. It's important to have these two points of view because they, um, well, they give you two points to approach possibility calculus and also the numerics. So this is important and it will become clear later on why these two points of view are, are important. Um, naturally, there's all already uh, also a generalization to uncertain vectors, so higher dimensional um, uncertain variables. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. But now this is a possibility density. And so this is basically already the, the very basics of possibility theory. And now I wanna talk about how can we use this possibility measure to, or possibility theory to have it as a framework for imprecise probabilities. So let's start with an engineer's point of view. Um, usually what, well, this, it's kind of a philosophical question, but usually you um, differentiate between aleatory and epistemic uncertainty, aleatory being something like random variability and epistemic, something like lack of knowledge. 
and oftentimes they they arise simultaneously in, in some sort of system that you want to analyze. And what we require for a universal framework to um, be able to quantify both these types of uncertainty is, for me, some type of probabilistic interpretation, um, which hints at the imprecise probability notion. And we want computational efficiency, and we want to be able to make robust predictions. And there's lots of uh, frameworks that would achieve this. So we have intervals, we have fuzzy sets, we have p-boxes, belief measures, lower provisions, and many more. And in terms of expressiveness, they all, like, you can more or less order them like that, maybe. Um, the most expressive um, framework being probability theory, because you only have aleatory uncertainty, which is, in a sense, a perfect description of the system, because there's no lack of knowledge, you know, everything that you have, that, that you can know, right? And well, I'm arguing that if we replace fuzzy sets by possibility measures or possibly theory, then we have a mathematically rigorous version of fuzzy set theory, which provides a universal framework for um, both these types of uncertainty to quantify it. Um, we have a simple and very intuitive calculus and many numerically efficient approaches. So, to make it a framework of imprecise probabilities, we need two principles. And the first and most important one is what's called probability possibility consistency. And I'm following here the approach by Didier Dubois as well. So basically the, the idea is to say that uh, a probability measure and a possibility measure are consistent if for all events, the possibility is an upper bound of the probability. And well, then we have as a, a corollary that the necessity is a lower probability. So you can see that right away. And this kind of already gives us the imprecise probabilities because instead of, of talking about precise probabilities, we just have the lower bound and upper bound. And we, also are, we are all, always talking about these interval value probabilities. And naturally, this is not a one-to-one -one relationship. So we have many probability measures, which would be consistent with a possibility measures, um, possibility measure. And we usually gather them in what we call the creedal set. And this is what we, yeah, how we write it. And the principle of representation basically says that a possibility measure is just a representation of its creedal set. Um, and whenever we do calculus with it, we should view that as a conservative counterpart to probabilistic calculus for all probabilities which are in, in this creedal set. And so this consistency criterion, even though it's beautiful in its simplicity, is a little hard to check. And luckily there is a necess necessary and sufficient condition to, to check it. And it's basically, if we assume the alpha cut view, what we're doing is we're, we're checking if we want to see if a probability distribution is consistent with a possibility distribution. We're just checking if the probability mass that is contained in any alpha cut, so those are the alpha cuts, um, is greater than or equal to one minus alpha. So if we um, plot this alpha against the probability in the alpha cut, we have here two areas and if, if this value here runs or this quantity runs or this, this line runs in the green area, then we're consistent. And if it touches the red area, then we're not consistent. And this has a neat interpretation because then we can say that alpha cuts are some kind of prediction sets. They provide like a set of possible outcomes for a guaranteed level of certainty. So if I say, um, for example, if I take the 0 0.6 alpha cut, then I know that with a probability of at least 0 0.4, um, X will be somewhere in this interval. And this is the idea. And well, what we're usually doing when we're performing a possibilistic uncertainty quantification, then we're st restricting ourselves to analyzing only these alpha cuts, not all events, but only the alpha cuts. So this is the principle of representation. What does it look like? Well, for example, the triangular fuzzy number, if we have a uniform probability density, which looks for example, which has this um, probability density function, then we see this is the consistency line. And we see if we evaluate the probability that is contained in any of these alpha cuts, that stays above the line. So we know that we're consistent. Same thing here. We have this Gaussian distribution, which is kind of cheated because I've, I'm cutting it off here at minus one and one. 
and we again see that it's well above this line, so we're all, also consistent. And lastly, we also have singletons, because we have here plausibility of one for this value of zero. So this is also accounted for, basically, this would be a precise knowledge that x is zero, and this is also consistent, but also for val only for values which have um, possibility one. And then what we see is, if we take the cumulative possibility and the cumulative necessity, then we see that the cumulative probability um, function is for all, in all three cases, is bounded from above and below. And this is again, this imprecise probability notion. So this is the, the principle of representation. And well, we see that, well, these three probability distributions and many, many more, and it's, there's an infinite number, are all contained in the creedal set of this triangular fuzzy number. So this is what a triangular fuzzy number means for me. And what we also need is the principle of maximum specificity. So suppose, for example, that we know that X is distributed according to some uniform distribution with a support minus AA, and we don't know the value of a, we just know that it's somewhere in zero and one. So then the DA Dubois would tell us, well, take the triangular fuzzy number. I've shown that this is, is consistent with all these uniform distributions. And then you could say, but this distribution, you can show that this is um, consistent as well. And now the question is, which one should I choose for modeling this, this type of uncertainty? And then you say, okay, I want to describe my information as precisely as possible. And we say that two possibility measures can be compared in terms of their specificity if, well, basically via this um, condition that the possibility is bounded from above by the other possibility for all events. And then we have that pi one is um, more specific than pi two. And this yields as a consequence that the creedal set is smaller. And if we only want to model this creedal set, the, the family of these distributions, we don't want any more distributions to be included in our in our creedal set. Unfortunately, we can't um, just construct a, prob a possibility distribution which has exactly only these distributions, but we want to stay as small as possible in terms of the set. And this is equivalent. Well, it's this is rather complicated, but the uh, equivalent condition is just that we say that the membership function here is um, pointwise lower than this one. So this would tell us that we should discard this distribution and we should take this distribution because it's more specific. So those are the two principles. And this gives us the imprecise probability view of possibility theory. And it's obviously connected to many other theories, dempster schaefer belief functions, P-boxes, intervals, non-additive measures, lower provisions. You can read it in this book, which is really good. And um, so this is the connection, but you can relate those, all those those frameworks. Um, so now we know how, how imprecise probabilities can arise from possibility theory. And now the, the most, for me, most important question is how can we model the uncertainty? So if we have one model belief, this is basically modeling epistemic uncertainty about a parameter value, then we should not artificially add information by specifying something like prior probability distribution or so. So if we only know the bounds of, of a variable, then we should just use an interval because we know that basically this um, interval has in its creedal set all probability distributions with the same support. And well, we don't know if there's anything else. We don't know if it's a singleton, so we should just use the interval. If we have an estimated quantity, we should encode the confidence intervals in, in, our, um, in our distribution. And this is what Michael Balch talked about a lot. And finally, if we have expert knowledge, what you call like that, for example, an expert telling you it's between this and this value with probability greater than 95%, then you should um, do it like this with this simple support function, which is more or less what, what Glenn Schaefer proposed in his book. So this is how you would model belief, epistemic uncertainty. What about if we have precise knowledge of a probability density, for example, well, then the principle of consistency and maximum specificity tell us we're, well, we, we know that we know this probability distribution and we are looking for some possibility distribution which um, has this probability distribution in its creedal set. And well, consistency and maximum specificity tell us that we should try to find a possibility distribution which achieves this equality. So consistency tells us we need something which is 
which fulfills um, greater than or equal and spe maximum specificity tells us then that this that we should aim for equal and this is well it looks more complicated than it actually is what you do is you propose some kind of ordering function which could be proportional to some kind of norm or here the probability density function it could also be proportional to the cumulative distribution function and this is sort of a prior I'll, I'll talk about that later and what you then do is you take the super level sets of this this value and integrate on them and if we then evaluate this this function here we know um, p of x and then we get a possibility density and then we can be sure that this possibility distribution is consistent and what we also see it is it preserves the order of this um, ordering function so for this ordering function we get this possibility d uh, density and for this ordering function we get this possibility density and both of these um, densities are consistent so we see that there's not one way to do this so we have many ways we have infinitely many possibility distributions which would be consistent with this probability distribution and it depends kind of on the type of application that you have but um, yeah and what you can also do is you can also use imprecise probability possibility transformation. So if you know, like in the example before, if we have a family of distributions that we would like to um, uh, encode in our possibility distributions, then we just add this infimum here. And then we also have consistency for all probability distributions in this family. And so how, how can we use that? Um, what I think is a neat example is, for example, let's suppose that we know about some, some variable that is positive and it has some, some expected value, but we don't know anything else. Then we know that the mark of inequality um, gives us this bound. And if we take, for example, this, this ordering function here, this exponential function, then we can use the imprecise probability possibility transform and we get this possibility density, which you see here. And this is guaranteed to contain all probability distributions of x um, for whom uh, x is positive and has this expected value, which is kind of nice. And you can do it for Chebyshev inequalities and many other, other things. So this is an example where you can use these transformations. Um, next, what I like to talk about is, is modeling data. So suppose we have samples and we want to to uh, find some some sort of possibility distribution, which then we can say, okay, well, we assume that there's a true probability distribution which has generated these data, but we don't know it. And we wanna find a possibility distribution which uh, is consistent with this true probability distribution. And so the, what we're, the idea behind this is that if we think about the, uh, the alpha cuts of our possibility distribution, then we would always expect the alpha cuts to contain a certain percentage of the samples. And this gives rise to this idea of percentage sets that are based on, on probability possibility transformations. And I'll, I'll explain in a second how it works. But we also, uh, well, now we have this ordering function and it is, is something like a plausibility prior because what we do beforehand is we assign subjective plausibilities of the different values that x could assume and then what we do is with this um, prior we take the super level sets and basically what we're just doing is counting we're counting how many samples are inside and how many are outside and from this we're trying to define a or to derive a possibility distribution and i'll explain to you now how it works so let's take for example the base the easiest um, concept which are mean percentage sets so again, we assume that there is a true probability distribution, we just don't know it. And we wanna find a possibility distribution which is consistent with it. So if we knew pa, um, P, X, then we could just use this, this transform here and we would be good. However, we don't know P. Um, so what we do is, what we can do is we can just use an estimator of, of this, this quantity here by just counting um, how many samples are in the super level set dividing by n and then this gives us a, an estimator so this is just just counting how many samples suffice this this um, condition here and well we know that this 
this distribution here converges to this distribution for infinitely many samples. So we also know that we're asymptotically consistent with the true underlying probability distribution and we have consistency asymptotically. And what we're doing is we're essentially computing the empirical cumulative distribution function and transforming it. So we have similar um, convergence properties to the empirical cumulative distribution function. And this is basically the easiest way that you can do it. So now here is an example. Let's start with just four samples from a normal distribution, standard normal distribution. We have this um, prior, which we're using. And now this is the, the orange line is the estimated possibility distribution that we're getting here. And this is um, the, the consistency criterion for Px the being the normal distribution. So we see here that we're not actually consistent, but we see that the, the more samples we take, the closer this grows to the consistency line, this gets sharper. And we see that for, for well, a large number of samples, we're basically, we've converged to this uh, line here and we have found, which is basically the, the um, analytical, which would be the analytical transform. So this is the, the easiest idea. Now the question is, can we also, well, we have, we see in the, the example before that we're sometimes below the consistency line and we'd like to avoid that. So can we do that? So this is the question. This is kind of related to, can we also express, this, uh, express distributional uncertainty? Um, for this, we can look at the imprecise probability possibility transform. So just adding here the infimum. And then this tells us we just need to find a lower bound for this, this expression here. And if we, if, we, if we had some bound for a given, well, now for a given level of reliability, then we could just um, estimate or find a possible distribution like this. So how can we do this? We, how can we find this lower bound? We just take a one-sided pearson clopper um, confidence interval. We just, again, we count how many samples um, are can uh, suffice this condition here. We have n samples in total, and then we just invert the beta distribution, and this gives us the lower bound. And the confidence level gamma here has a nice interpretation because it gives us the coverage probability, and this is basically the con uh, probability of consistency. So how does it look? We have here for different values of gamma, um, the, the estimated possibility distribution, we see that for higher levels of gamma, so higher reliability, we're also higher because we're, we're growing less specific. We're including more probability distributions. Um, but we see that they grow closer together. And, but what we also see is that the, for gamma equals 0.99, we're basically always above the consistency line. So this is basically guaranteed consistency. And we see also that this for infinitely many samples converges to the same possibility distribution. And this is how we can model from data. So I've talked about how we can model from data and how we can model from, from knowledge. And now the question is, well, we're engineers, so we want to compute with it, right? So what types of questions do we usually um, have in engineering? Well, we have this, this function here, y is phi of x and theta. So what do we do if we know theta and we have some possibilistic information on x? What can we say about y then? And the other, question would be, we have some possible seek information on x and we can measure y. So what can we tell, tell about theta? This would be something like parameter estimation. So the forward problem here is well, basically propagation and the inverse problem is something like statistical inference. And both these, these I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, um, both these problems also rely on, on aggregation. And I'll, I'll yeah. I'll just explain this. So the forward problem is, um, on a, well, on a theoretical basis, it's very easy. We had just have y is an uncertain variable as a, as a function of phi and of this uncertain variable. So we can just define here the push forward um, possibility distribution. And this gives us basically the extension principle that Lot Fizade or originally proposed. What we're doing here, if we wanna find the possibility of an output value we're just looking for feasible input values, which would, which would give us this output value, and we're looking for the maximum possibility. And this is the, the general extension principle. On an alpha cut view, we have 
that the alpha the output alpha cut is phi of the input alpha cut. Theta is known, right? So if we have this input possibility and some, some function, then we get this output possibility. And the neat thing is if we compute this by the extension principle, and then we know, okay, we have this creedal set. We have, for example, this input probability, which is consistent with this possibility. And now we can also um, transform this output. Uh, we can compute this output probability. And what we can actually, what we have guaranteed is that these two um, measures are also consistent. So whenever we're compute, well, whenever we are propagating possibilities, we're also propagating the entire creedal set because this is true for every every probability distribution. So this is the propagation of the creedal set. And now, if you look at the the extension principle, we see here that we basically we need the joint distribution. So if we have marginal variables x1 to xn and we only have the marginal distributions and now the question is how can we con construct this pi x if we have more than one variable if we have only one then it's clear but if we have two or more then it's not so clear um, and now what Zadi or originally proposed was this non-interactive aggregation which is just taking the minimum of the individual um, possibilities but this is not generally consistency preserving. And what I mean by consistency preserving is if we take the independent aggregation, then if we use this formula here, then I can guarantee that if x1 and x2, xn are stochastically independent, then any joint distribution that you could form with any combination of these marginal distributions, of these marginal probability distributions, um, is also consistent to this joint possibility distribution. So for stochastic independence, we we have this aggregation here, and this is a neat little formula that pops up every once in a while in different contexts. I think Michael Balch presented it as the combination of confidence intervals, and um, I th I know that it's also you can use it as a result of um, the rule of combination, Dempsey's rule of combination for possibility distribution. So it's it's a it's a formula that's worth remembering. And lastly, we also have this, what I call the Bonferroni aggregation. So if we don't know anything about x, how, how x1 to xn are correlated, then we can just use this aggregation and it um, guarantees us that any, any joint distribution that would have this, these marginal distributions for any one of, out of the creedal set is actually consistent. So this is robustly consistency preserving. This is, if you don't, don't know anything about x1 to xn, just use this aggregation and you're, you're guaranteed to preserve consistency. And what does it look like? So if we have, for example, here, two triangular fuzzy numbers and we want to aggregate them, then Jade, Zade's joint distribution would give us these this type kind of pyramid here. If we use the independent um, joint distribution, we get something a little more bulky and less specific. And one for Oni's joint distribution is obviously even less specific. So this is kind of the trade-off we're increasing in consistency here. This remember for any any type of com combination of probability distributions out of the marginal creedal sets, this is consistent. Um, but we're having a trade-off here between consistency and specificity because this is obviously the most specific, even though it's only consistent for very special cases. So this is the aggregation, and so. Now, an interesting question is what happens for large n? So if we're aggregating a lot of marginal distributions, well, we see here that the marginal possibilities are being mapped to the joint possibilities. And basically what we're seeing is if we increase n, then we're converging point wisely here to the, to the interval, maybe, well, to zero or one valued um, possibility density. So this is the same for the Bonferroni aggregation. It's even worse here. So the conclusion would be that if we have many marginal variables, then it's not really sensible to perform possibilistic uncertainty quantification. We can just use interval analysis because we're barely losing anything. Um, further issues with the aggregation are that we don't have associativity, which is a, a whole topic by itself. And what's unfortunate for the independent and the Bonferroni aggregation is that the marginalization and the aggregation are not inverse operations. But you just have to be aware of that. It's not, not 
a huge deal. You just have to know this. So now I've talked about the aggregation. Um, so now let's look at an example again. So assume we want to compute y being this, this expression here, and we have marginal input possibility distributions for x1 and x2. And those are these two triangular fuzzy numbers. Then what we do is we compute the joint um, distribution via the independent aggregation for n equals two. For example, we could also use the Bonferroni aggregation. And then we can, well, we have now the joint distribution and we can plug this into our extension principle and then we can compute here the output. So if, if you know, if you remember Zadi's extension principle from before, he would have just written here the minimum of the, the individual possibilities. It's a little more complicated, but it's not actually much more complicated. It's just a slight rescaling actually. It's nonlinear, but it's just rescaling the the output that Zade's extension principle would give you. So this is propagation. Now the question is, what, what about the inverse problem? So we can measure why we have some possibilistic information on x and we don't know nothing about theta. Um, what I've shown is that you can use possibilistic information on x, that, it's, that this possibilistic information is actually sufficient, but not usually efficient in the statistical sense, to use it as a pivotal quantity. So you can Derive, use this to derive a confidence distribution of the uncertain parameter theta. Uh, this is this should be a theta here. Well, the other theta, this theta. Um, so we have this confidence distribution, which is basically a possibility distribution. I'll, I'll talk about that in, in a second. Um, but we can also derive a confidence membership, which is just the plausibility of the possible values. If we have this structural equation here, we compute it like this, which looks very similar to the extension principle if we have a pivotal equation. So basically the inverse with respect to x and y of this phi here, then it's even easier to compute the confidence density. And the fun thing about this, this confidence density is that if we take the alpha cuts, so the super level sets, we get actually two frequentist confidence sets of our true parameter theta, um, which we don't know. So how does it look like? So suppose we have here a very simple example. We observe y and we know it's, it's a sum of x and theta. We have some, some information on x, but not, we don't know anything about theta. And we have independent observations, y1 to yn. Then what can we do? Well, suppose we know about our pivotal quantity only that it is expected value of zero and variance of one. The higher order moments are unknown. So then we can just use this Chebyshev distribution, which is similar to this Markov distribution that I talked about earlier. Um, this distribution contains all the um, probability distributions which have this expected value and this variance. And now we can use this um, to aggregate all the x's because we have, well, in reality, we have for every y, we have an x. So we have to aggregate these with, with n um, as the yeah, as a rescaling exponent, and then we have our pivotal equation. We just rewrite this as x equals y minus theta, and then we can use this to to derive this confidence distribution, which has this density here. And I said before that a confidence distribution is basically a possibility distribution. It's just not technically one because it doesn't reach one here. So this is kind of an issue that I haven't like worked out. 100%, but I wanted to talk about this. Um, well, again, these the alpha cuts here are confidence sets above here, they're empty. I'm not sure what this tells me, <laughs> but uh, so yeah, you have this confidence distribution. It, it behaves like a possibility distribution. It's just, it just isn't one from the definition. And now how can we put this in a big picture? So we have our forward problems we, where we know theta and we want to uh, compute y and we have our inverse problems where we observe y and we know want to know something about theta. So for the forward problem we have in the membership view here the extension principle and in the for the inverse problem we have something which looks very different uh, very similar to the to the extension principle. It's just basically we're exchanging what we're looking for, what we want to know something about. So here we don't know theta, here we don't know y. And this is basically here, what's standing here and here is basically the same thing. And the same is true for the alpha cut view. We have two very similar um, solutions to these types of problems. So what we can actually do is we can write 
this in a sort of universal extension principle. We just define an implicit relationship uh, as zero is xi of x and q. X is the variable that we have possibilistic information about, and Q is the quantity that we want to infer something about. It doesn't matter now if it's if it's Y, if it's an uncertain variable, or if it's just a parameter that we don't know nothing about. And then we compute um, a possibility density or a confidence density with this, this uh, with this universal extension principle, which, which you can express either in this manner or in this manner. And this is yeah the big picture. So now, how can we compute with that? What, what's the numerics behind this? Um, there are basically three ways you can, oops, basically three ways that you can do this. The first one would be membership-based uncertainty quantification. So this is useful for analytical solutions or simple queries. For example, if we want to, well, we have here our, our universal extension principle. This is the membership-based extension principle, and for, now let's assume we want to find out what's the possibility of Q being greater, uh, less than zero. So then we just um, evaluate this. And basically what we have is if this is the area X, um, which is consistent with Q being less than zero, and this is our membership or joint membership, then what we're looking for instead of in, as in, in probability theory, where we, we, we try to quantify this area and to measure this area, we're just looking for the maximum membership. So this is basically optimization. And if we have just one query, just something like this, then it's very useful to just um, write this here in an optimization problem and solve it with your favorite optimizer. Second way of looking at it is the alpha cut based uncertainty quantification where we have the alpha cut based universal extension principle. And this can be, well, it's, it's a whole theory by itself, but you can usually um, solve these by interval methods on an alpha cut basis, which are these brand and branch and bound type algorithms, which we have, well, which you can find, for example, in this book, which is really covers a whole range of these problems. You can also use the FIVIA algorithm, which is uh, a slight uh, modification of the CVIA algorithm, which is, is explained herein. And the nice thing is that you have this guaranteed robustness, which you get from, from these interval methods. So uh, save for the, the rounding error, you, you, this is a, um, a robust approximation, outer approximation of my, of my true alpha cut. So this is, this is something which is very useful if we, if we want to give definite bounds for our probabilities. And lastly, which I should also mention is sampling-based CQ which Michael Bolch also talked about a lot. Uh, it's usually only applicable for the forward propagation. I haven't yet made it work for the inverse problem. Um, it's, but for the forward problem, it's very simple, intuitive, and efficient. So what we do is we basically just sample our input possibility distribution, and we propagate these samples through our function. And then what we know is we can kind of keep the membership. So we get the sampling haze here. And if we kind of take a tablecloth and let it fall, and what it gives us is basically the membership function. And this is a little different from Monte Carlo methods because what we're trying to do here is we're trying to resolve the edge of this alpha cut instead of the, the volume. But it it's, comes down to your favorite sampling strategy, even though you don't have to think so hard about the, the best sampling strategy because well, you're not measuring volume, so it's not, not that important. Um, but well, typically, the more samples you have, the closer you get to, to a very good resolution of this edge here. So this kind of concludes my talk. I have a couple of takeaway messages, which if you haven't understood anything, just take these with you. So well, possibly theory can be arrived very similarly to possibly uh, probability theory. We have these two fundamental views, which also give rise to these different numerical approaches. We have these two imprecise probability principles, representation and maximum specificity. Um, well, we have seen how we can model um, both aleatory and epistemic uncertainty from knowledge and from data, which is something that, that's really um, useful in my, my opinion. We have seen these consistent aggregation operations. We have seen that interval analysis is limit case of possibilistic uncertainty quantification. We know that um, possibilistic variables can be used as pivotal quantities in statistical inference. 
And yeah, we have these different approaches to numerical uncertainty quantification. Um, so my, my, the topic of my research are these in, inverse problems and I have some open questions. So one which is rather, I don't know, is what about possibilistic fields? So I've, I've said before that interval analysis is the limit case. So if we have really an infinity of, of, of random variables, should we just use interval fields right away? Does it even make sense to talk about possibilistic fields? And um, then we have the question, these reliable percentage sets, I, I have here this confidence level, is this some type of type two fuzzy membership? Um, this would be something that's worth or interesting to, to, to discuss. Um, how do we treat these subnormal confidence distributions? What does it mean if, there is, if it's an empty confidence set? Because, well, we don't, it behaves like a possibility distribution, it just isn't one. Um, we have these non-uniqueness issues for aggregation, estimation, and transformation, which kind of depend on the prior, even though prior is like, you have to be careful with this because it's, it's a lot, we're presupposing a lot less than, than the Bayesian prior would assume. Um, but we have these non-uniqueness issues depending on the prior. Um, how can we put, you, use these, these techniques with surrogate modeling, which, which surrogate models complement possibilistic uncertainty quantification? Um, can we improve the expressiveness of, of comp, uh, possibility distributions? Because we have this fundamental source of coarseness here, which says that either the possibility is one or the necessity is zero. So we also al always have probability bounds of zero something or something one. And lastly, which is maybe also a good starter for, for a discussion now, can we use results from possibility theory to re rederive similar ones in other frameworks and, and the other way around? Uh, I have here some references. So for the aggregation operations and how you can use possibilistic calculus as a conservative counterpart to probabilistic calculus, which kind of explores this consistency paradigm. We have the... Uh, probability, possibility, transformations, percentage sets, and the FIVI algorithm, and the possible pivotal, pivotal quantities are not yet published. They were supposed to appear in the proceedings of the REC, which is now um, postponed, but we have a preprint available. And now I'm very happy to discuss with you. Yes, thank you uh, for your talk. I um, hope I'm in time. Oh, maybe, yeah. It's good, That's right? fine. No, it's good. <laughs> good. Um, yeah, so how we do questions here is if you have a question, you should be able to click raise hand. Um, I think it's in the participant menu next to your name. Um, I then usually go through uh, the questions there. Um, Could you moderate because I'm... I'm, I'm kind of overwhelmed here with, with the Zoom thing. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the problem. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so uh, Adolphus, you have a question. Should we go ahead? Hi, uh, thank you so much, Simon. So uh, good afternoon, Dominic. I basically have two questions pertaining to the what we just discussed this afternoon. So, but first of all, thank you so much for your insightful discussion. I think it's a really, really uh, interesting topic that you just brought forward for all of us. So, um, essentially, my first question is, um, if you could go to the, the, the slide where you talk about, uh, you had an application where you had a two-dimensional PDF and you talk about some independent, independent oh, yeah. property. Uh, yeah. well, let me see if I can, yeah. Go back, you mean, no, wait, this one? Um, no, not or this one. This uh, one, maybe? The one that yeah, is, is an application where you had this um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. distribution. Uh, yeah. Now my computer is stuck. Oh, oh, no something, something's saving. Sorry. Yeah, no worries, no worries. <laughs> so now, uh, this one you're talking about, right? Ah, uh, this is the one. Yeah. Okay. So I would like to ask, um, with what we just uh, uh, like, like uh, talk about over here for this slide, mm -hmm. how would the framework be different, if any, if the two variables x1 and x2 are correlated? So, well, usually if they're correlated, it would be useful to to find a better relationship for the for the um, for the joint distribution. So you 
try to find like a, a source, like you try to reduce it to, to some independent variables and then okay. just find, try to find a relationship. Um, it's not that easy, I agree. Um, if you just assume that they're correlated but you don't know how, then you should just use this, what I call the Bonferroni aggregation, which would give you this wider, um, even less specific joint distribution. Right, so it probably is a wider bound to like try to incorporate as many yeah. uh, possibilities. So but that's only if you don't know know about the correlation. If you know about the correlation, try to reduce it to some some independent sources of the uncertainty, which you can then uh, aggregate with this formula. Right. So in essentially, it's just about scaling. Try to rescale the parameters so that it becomes decoupled. Yes. All right. All right. Okay. Sure. All right, so uh, moving on to my second question. So um, earlier on, we discussed about the use of the weight function. Okay, I have to apologize for this question because uh, I was actually, I, I, I missed that, that bit uh, yeah. of the lecture. So I would just like to ask if you could explain like, like what exactly uh, the weight function does. And, and oh. you're, you're talking about what I call the possibility prior or something? Yeah, I believe right? that's the one. So we have here this plausibility prior, maybe it's, it's better explained here. So suppose, uh, da, da, da. I'm not, oh, sorry, ordering function. Yeah, yeah this is the ordering function, but it's basically the same thing. So suppose yeah. you didn't know about this PDF here, this blue one, and mm -hmm. you, wanted, you wanted to infer something like a, a consistent possibility distribution. So then this would be something like your prior where you're saying, okay, I think these values are less plausible and these are more plausible. So for example, or maybe here, 0 0.5 is more plausible than 0 0.2, but that's basically all you're saying. Yeah. Um, this plausibility degree does not give you the latter um, membership degree, it's just, it's rescaled. So your shift, well, what you're doing in the estimation procedure is you're sh shifting the, the super level sets of, of the, the prior mm -hmm. um, to the different, alpha cuts. That's basically the idea. It doesn't affect your consistency. It doesn't matter which, which ordering function you're taking. Yeah. It's just, it yields different um, shapes of your possibility distribution, but that's the only difference. You always have consistency. Right. And and so for example, in, 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 uh, in this example here, if I took a different prior, it wouldn't, well, I'd get a different possibility distribution here, but this would not look much different. Okay. So the consistency would be the same. All right. Yeah, because I was a little bit confused initially, like, like yep. this is different from, from like what we call the, um, the important sampling technique, right? This is entirely, is, is it, yeah. is, is this entirely different from, from that? Okay. Yes. okay. Right. Because I, I was initially confused with yeah. uh, like, if it's, if it's, an, no, if it's, it's not, similar. it's not important sampling. It's just, yeah. no, 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 no. Right. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much for the clarification. Uh, you're welcome. Yeah. Thanks for your questions. No worries. Thank you. Okay, I think we might have another question. Hello, yeah. Yes, okay. I'm Diego, hi. Yeah. Hi, Dominic. Thank you hey. for your presentation. It's really good. I just uh, wanted to ask you, uh, what do you mean about the effectiveness? You showed some uh, different concepts uh, that are used in imprecise probabilities, like putting intervals and then the... The expressiveness, right? Yes. Yeah. This, this slide? Exactly, that one. So what I'm saying is, um, this is something I, I kind of hinted at it. So I said that if you have, for example, here in the, in the example with the, the maximum specificity, you're saying, okay, I know that X is distributed something like this, but I don't know which one. So now the, the best possible model of this uncertainty would be some kind of creedal set that would only um, contain these distributions here. But in possibility theory, that's not possible. So you can't just derive one possibility distribution which contains only these probability distributions and nothing else. So this is basically what I mean by expressiveness. Intervals, they just bound you the support of your probability distribution. Possibility measures are a little better. They give you these, these prediction sets. Then you have P boxes where you can bound the cumulative distribution function, but you 
don't have, I think as far as I know, you don't have this requirement that one of them is always zero, if I recall that correctly, but I stand to be corrected on that. Yeah, okay. And then you have belief measures in the, in the dempster Schaefer sense where you can just uh, model your uncertainty more expressively in, in this sense, but the cal calculus also gets a little more involved in my opinion. And then you have lower provisions and all this crazy stuff, which is very hard to compute with. So in expressive, expressiveness would be like you, you can get more information out of your model by using yeah. less so yes. data or something like that? Yes, it's in this sense. So you can specify better which probability distributions you're talking about and which you're not talking about. Right, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any uh, other questions at all? Oh, hey, yeah, I, I've got stuff, but I wanted to wait till everyone else was done. <laughs> Jump in. Hi. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Okay, so um, first question I had, a very basic. Um, so, um, and these are all going to be about your work on the inverse problem. So uh, my first question is, are you, um, when you work on the inference problem, are you working from kind of an independent literature in the possibility theory community or? No. Um, or are you just kind of going at that from scratch? It's, there hasn't been said very much on the inverse problem in possibility theory as far as I'm aware, but I'm, um, sure. so I just found about out about your work when when uh, Marco invited me to to this talk, and then I looked at the website, and I didn't know you were you you were working on this as well. And then I got really excited and watched your talks. <laughs> so, uh, but it's 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 hard to find literature. So yeah, yeah. this what I've done so I, I know far. How you feel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this what I what I did here is basically. That's something I derived myself just from, from statistics text, textbooks. Okay, cool. No, that's good. And of course, there's also uh, Ryan's work, which is yes. in a similar vein. Yes. Um, you know, he and I were working independently for almost a decade before we uh, found each other. I, ah, just okay. to, um, I just happened to find a paper from his from like 2014 that's like p-values or plausibility. And I was like, I was saying that in 2014. <laughs> So I, I should probably mention Didier Dubois again because he had mm -hmm. some thoughts on, on statistical inference. Mm -hmm. um, but he's he's always kind of, I think he, he's like torn mm -hmm. between the qualitative possibility theory and the quantitative possibility theory. What we're, well, what I'm talking here about is quantitative possibility theory, which for me is imprecise probabilities. And so he's always looking at the broader scheme and not not going so much into detail here. So, yeah, I I wish I could recommend literature to you, but no, no, that's fine. There's... If if it's not there, then it's not. I just want to make sure, you know, as as we all find each other, that we're kind of bringing this together in a yeah. kind of unified, you know, literature tradition. Because yeah. yeah, I do think possibility theory is the future of statistical inference. Um, I think so too, because we have these nice frequentists interpretations for me well for me they're frequentist i'm not sure yeah no they if are. it's if it's if it's actually frequentist or fiducial or or whatever but yeah that's a good it, it's kind of it, i think the way ryan and i put it is it, it's in the fiducial tradition you know we're, yeah. we're doing that thing where um you know we want a you know a distribution of belief or plausibility um but we want it on frequentist terms i think it's more frequentist yeah than, uh the fiducial tradition was though like, yes yeah um okay so i have another question slash may be able to answer a question for you mm -hmm. um you had that poss well that not quite possibility distribution that wasn't yes. at one um, um here and forgive me for having not been focused enough how did you get that so i, I well, can get that too when it has a specific meaning but okay oh, yeah, yeah so while you're observing y um you have this possibilistic information on x so you say okay i know the 
expected value is zero, variance is one. So mm -hmm. I don't know anything else. I'm using this Trebuchet distribution. Okay. Um, and now, well, I'm su I, I oh, need n pivotal quantities. <laughs> no, no, no. This looks like, well, this is what I, what I said about this, this formula here, that it pops up everywhere. And I think mm -hmm. they're all related. So this is, I think you also talked about it when you, when you were combining confidence distributions. You also, well, well, you, you mentioned variables, it. Yeah. And but this is all on the same variable, right? Or no? No, no this no, is on no, different no. variables. Those okay, are different okay, variables. Okay. So this is the neat thing that it pops up in different contexts, but it's always the same formula. So Didier Dubois derived it as, as a result of Dempsey's rule of combination. Mm -hmm. And what I did is just, I derived it for the independent aggregation of, of these pivotal quantities. So I'm just saying the, the pivotal quantities Xi here are all independent. So this is the joint distribution that I'm getting. And okay. then I have this pivotal equation, which is like a vector equation in, in reality. And then with this equation, it boils down to this equation here with which I can compute the possibility density. And then you get in this guy over here. And I get this subnormal confidence density. Okay. So, so, I mean, the, the neat interpretation is that I can say here, I have this, this one value, which let's say it's 0.4 possibility. And I can guarantee you that in 60%, of the time I'm applying this procedure, it's exactly this value, um, <laughs> which is yeah. neat, but I wish, I, yeah. I mean, it also depends obviously on the way that you're using your pivotal quantities, which pivotal quantities you're using, and then you get better or worse distributions, but yeah. So, so I can tell you what it, um, so, so I do all of this, you know, with test statistics, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, to get test statistic to p value and then p value for each uh, parameter value is a um, possibility distribution. Um, and when I get something that doesn't peak at one, and I think it means the same way here, but it's a little more, same thing here, but it's a little more complicated. It basically means that in some sense, my test statistic did not assume the uh, family of distributions that I'm doing inference on. Basically, it means I'm doing inference on a larger space of possible distributions than what I'm actually showing. You know what I mean? Uh, yes, but and, then I, would, I would think that this is not the same thing because what yeah. I, I did here, well, when I derived, what I did on the computer for this, for this picture here is yeah. I drew samples from the normal distribution, which from the standard normal distribution, which would be well, main, well inside the creedal set here. Mm -hmm. So I, I can guarantee you that this, this, um, the distribution here is inside of my pivotal quantity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't know what to tell you then about how you're getting this guy. Yeah. Um, I'm not. E I'm not even sure if I should be unhappy about it. So this um, is. <laughs> <laughs> so far, I'm not too 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 disappointed. I just I'm not 100 percent sure what to make of it. Mm. Okay. Well, good luck with that. I <laughs> I, I might. Uh, maybe we can we can discuss this. Yeah. More. Yeah. Okay. And I just had one stray thought while you were giving your presentation. Yes. Which is, this is um, just, as you noted, there, there seems to be a parallel between things that work for statistical inference and see things that work for, you know, uh, propagating a possibility distribution yeah. that is capturing a, um, a, a probability distribution. Mm -hmm. And if we had some sort of theoretical result that generalizes that, that says, you know, wherever you capture a probability distribution, you'll also be capturing, um, uh, you'll also, you know, something, something will be parallel to statistical inference. If we had some sort of generalized result, that would make the statistical inference of things a lot easier. Like if all you had to prove is that, you know, if we had a probability distribution here, we'd be capturing it. You know what I mean? That's a lot easier to prove than, you know, directly proving um, something will work for statistical inference. 
This is <laughs> like this gets really close to Bayesian inference, I think. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I I think I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, it, it was just a straight thought, and I feel like I'm not conveying it really well right now. No, I've um, yeah, I've been. So for me, this sounds sounds a little Bayesian. I'm forgive me if it's not. Uh, mm. So I've been thinking about how this this fits into the Bayesian framework, but so far I haven't been able to tell you like implicitly what which priors I'm assuming or or this stuff. Um, mm. So far, know. what I've what I've thought of is this this big picture here. It's not really, yeah. So for me, this yeah. This is this is how I see it. You have this feasible space, and then you're looking for feasible combinations, and yeah, maybe okay. yeah. The other, yeah, no, no. I'm <laughs> just I'm just thinking loud now, so this is this won't go anywhere. <laughs> okay, that, that's fine. But yeah, be be in touch. Um, Ryan has a whole book on his stuff. Yeah, and, I've um, I've been trying to get it through the library, but. Right now, this is complicated due to the circumstances. <laughs> yes, it's. So, but I want to read it. I I have it on my list. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, thank you. Thanks um, for your comments. Yeah. Well, are there any other questions? I, um, definitely not any hands up. Left. I think we saw Alex's hand up, but he's taking it down. Yeah, I'm assuming he doesn't want to ask a question or it's been answered in that character. Um, or he can just jump in now if he so, so desires. Um, so you if, can also voluntarily unmute him too, find out what he's up to. <laughs> that's, well, that's too much power for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, it's just, um, I, I, yeah, just not sure how to. Express what I was thinking of, and a lot, of, a lot of the questions that I had have been answered already, anyway. So I'm fine. So Simon, you had a question. I have a question, um, slightly beyond my uh, remit, I think. <laughs> In this case, unfortunately. Go ahead. Um, yeah, but if there's no more questions then uh, I guess I'll just end the formal uh, talk and I'll stop recording. But before I do, say thank you, Dominic, for giving an interesting uh, talk. Uh, thanks for listening. I I'm going to stay on and talk to Dominic if you have some time, Dominic. Yeah, yeah sure. I'm, I'm free. I'm... So uh, we'll have a further discussion after this. Okay. <laughs>